So here we have Colleen Ravden and her presentation today is the carbon cycle adventures of a carbon atom from the dawn of the earth to the year 2200. Mm -hmm. And Colleen Ravden is the founder of Urban Ecos, she, which Urban Ecos promotes sustainability through the wise use of natural resources, consulting on projects, looking to mitigate greenhouse gas, discover ecosystem service benefits, and tech transfer and education. And on a personal note, Colleen is one of our go-to people to address and solve technical issues, as well as exploring new ideas and opportunities. And we find laughter and a fun along the way. So Colleen is one of my favorite people in the industry, and hopefully it sounds like she's bringing some fun for you right now. So take it away, Colleen. Okay. So I changed the title of my presentation to the carbon cycle adventures of a carbon atom from the dawn of the universe to the oh. year 2200, because I thought we needed a few extra billion years here. So Nancy asked me if I would give this sort of scientific 15 minute presentation that gives the underpinnings of the relationship between trees and wood and climate change so that we are all sort of talking about from the same platform for those of us for whom our science education might lie a little farther in the past. And we're going to take this journey uh, along with one particular carbon atom who I'm going to call Carl. So our story starts as all good stories do with the Big Bang, the hypothesized enormous explosion that created the universe. And that explosion also created the first three elements in the periodic table, hydrogen, you, helium, that's what and saying, helium. I couldn't tell you, we're interacting and talking. Yeah. Are, we, are we okay? Yes, we're okay. Okay, Sorry. and here are people in the back. So no, I'm, no. Still, I'm still doing okay though. No, no, move off. All right, so Big Bang, 13 and a half billion years ago, creation of hydrogen, helium, mm -hmm. and lithium. They were shot out across time and space mm -hmm. where they traveled and traveled and eventually formed the first stars about a billion years later. So in the furnace of those very hot stars, the next bunch of things in the periodic table of elements all the way up through iron were created, including our friend Carl. So he was born in a star, which then collapsed and exploded as a supernova and sent him shooting through space again for about 8 billion years, so he happens on the birth of our solar system and the Earth. So swirling gases create the sun, swirling space dust creates the Earth. Here's an artist's rendition of that early Earth, a very inhospitable place. Um, and I like to think that Carl came riding in on an asteroid and adhered to the surface of the Earth. So over about half a billion years, another 500 million years, Earth's early atmosphere starts to form. Basically from being the Earth's surface being bombarded and kicking things up in the air. And also there were lots and lots of volcanoes. And in the heart of those volcanoes, Carl is combined for the first time with two oxygen with an oxygen molecule, two oxygen atoms, and he becomes CO2 and is released in that volcanic explosion into the atmosphere for the first time as a greenhouse gas four billion years ago. This is a very hypothetical um, timeline of the evolution of the Earth's atmosphere, but we're talking about a point right here about four billion years ago, where the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is starting to climb from those explosions and the volcanoes and everything. And eventually it reaches a peak of about 30%. So that's an interesting fact to keep in mind. The current level of CO2 in the atmosphere is on the order of 0.04%. So it was a miserable, miserable place, that early Earth. So Carl hangs out in the atmosphere and he starts to cycle in and out. Life develops. The earliest, um, the earliest life were these unicellular organisms. And I like to think that Carl was, you know, a lipid in a chain of DNA. Another billion years pass and we get the first photosynthetic organisms, cyanobacteria. Maybe Carl's in a cell wall. Then the first multicellular organisms, another billion years later, things like red algae. And there's Carl hanging out in a um, chloroplast molecule. 
Another billion years pass, and we get the first life on uh, the first animal life on Earth. And maybe Carl was hanging out in a cholesterol molecule, and he's cycling in and out of these things. Another hundred million years, and we got the first land plants, which were plain old mosses. And maybe there's Carl in a phospholipid and a membrane of a ribosome or something. So between the cyanobacteria and the mosses, enormous changes were happening to the Earth's early atmosphere. A lot of that CO2 is being pulled out. Some oxygen is being pumped in. And it's thought that this new, more pleasant atmosphere enabled an enormous wave of evolutionary diversification. So we went from like jellyfish and sponges and mosses over the next 200 million years to a world that would have been wildly exotic to us, but in its structure would have maybe felt comfortable. So we had enormous plants, hundreds of feet tall, with dragonflies six feet long, uh, giant cockroaches. Blah, um, and this was the Carboniferous period. Interestingly, what we didn't have in the Carboniferous period, what hadn't yet evolved, were the decomposers. So there's Carl on a tree fern. When that tree fern dies and falls over like its friends here, there's nothing that's able to break down the very heavy bark-like substance full of lignin that these plants were made of. So instead of decomposing, they just lie there. And more trees fall on top, and more trees fall on top, and sediment covers them, and water moves in, and ice ages come and go. And over time, they get buried, and the heat and pressure push the water out, create some chemical transformations, and Carl is locked inside a giant bed of coal or other fossil fuels. So this was a period in which all of the coal and fossil fuels on the earth were created because of the absence of decomposers. And so Carl spends the next 299,999,750 years, approximately, in a coal bed. So this is Wales, which in my mind is sort of like like one giant coal bed, very beautiful though. So there's Carl hanging out there for nearly 300 million years until the dawn of the industrial revolution in the late 1700s, when we discovered at a large scale that we could dig up carbon, set it on fire and use it to power the world. So let's look a little bit more closely what's going on there. Here's Carl in an open pit coal mine and that coal looks something like this. It's actually, interestingly, the chemical structure of coal isn't really that well understood, but it's got these complicated organic molecules and there's Carl hanging out in a benzene ring. And we burn him with oxygen like we burn everything. And out of that, we get lots and lots of energy plus water plus CO2. So Carl's returned again to his carbon dioxide form and let loose into the atmosphere to wreak havoc on the climate. So there he is in the coal mine. We burn him. He joins with his oxygen molecule buddy and he's shot back into the atmosphere. So what does this look like in practical terms? This is a chart that shows CO2 in parts per million in the atmosphere over about the last 800,000 years. And it's interesting to see that it's cycled in and out of this relatively narrow band, up and down, up and down the highest sort of recent peak being about 300 parts per million. Now you remember, we talked about the very early part of the Earth's history, then it was at about 300,000 parts per million, but that was not really conducive to life. We don't want to get back there. So then we started burning a lot of coal here and about 1950, we passed that recent historic CO2 level and have shot straight up and continue basically to shoot straight up to the current level around 420 parts per million. So scientists and engineers have the job of figuring out how to stop having to burn fossil fuels. And that's probably going to look like nuclear power and some renewable energy, um, wind and solar, things like that. So they'll work their work and we'll work ours. And our responsibility will be to plant more trees. So let's think about how that actually works. It works through the magic of photosynthesis. And I'm calling it magic because it's such an insanely complicated process. I remember having to memorize it in Bio 101 and I refused to think about it again for this presentation. But fundamentally what's happening is that trees are pulling lots of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, lots of water out of their environment, 
and then using sunlight as a fuel, breaking apart and rearranging those molecules to create sugars and oxygen as a waste product, which we're very grateful for. So the oxygen is given off. Okay, so let's just start again with photosynthesis and its miracle. Trees are pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, water out of their environment, and then using fuel, the fuel of sunlight, they're breaking apart those molecules, putting them back together as uh, sugar and oxygen. So the oxygen is given off as a waste product that we are gratefully breathing. And those sugar molecules like build on each other and become basically the matter of which the tree is made. So the sugar molecules reform into different, more complicated organic molecules and they build the matter of trees, the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the roots, the fruit, the flower, all of that is made of basically of these sugar molecules. So Carl, there he is hanging out in the atmosphere and we bring him in through photosynthesis and we lock him up in a sugar molecule inside that tree. So just as in passing here, let's like, this makes it very clear that the bigger our tree, the more sugar molecules it has, therefore the more CO2 it has pulled out of the atmosphere. There are some other factors involved, but generally speaking, in this case, bigger is clearly better in terms of, C of CO2 functionality. So let's talk about those numbers and what they look like in practical terms. So in honor of our Cuff hosts in their home in Marin, let's talk about a hundred year old redwood. We can use a tool like eye tree planting to figure out the kind of CO2 work that that tree is doing. So we see here that it's sequestered or absorbed about 13,000 kilograms or 13 tons of CO2 over its lifetime. And the eye tree planting will also tell us how much biomass is in that tree. So if we take that tree, put it on a scale, evaporate all the water out of it, what we have left is about seven tons of tree matter. Now, interestingly, that means we have actually about three and a half tons of carbon. So about half of all of that dry weight biomass of the tree is carbon. And we can reach way back to our high school or college chemistry and think about the great Avogadro and his number. And we can use that weight to estimate that locked up inside that 100 year old redwood is 1.75 times 10 to the 29th carbon atoms or 175 octillion carls in that one tree alone. The problem is though, that the carboniferous era is no longer with us. So Carl's fate and the Redwood's fate are no longer what they were 300 million years ago. Now, when that tree falls over in the forest, it doesn't just lie there and get buried and turned into coal. In fact, there'll never be coal again. Now we have decomposers and they're extremely efficient of which the fungi mushrooms are perhaps the most important. So what happens when the mushrooms get to work on that tree? Well, they take complicated organic molecules, they add their mushroom enzymes, and out of that we get slightly less complicated organic molecules and CO2 again. So Carl is once again transformed into CO2 and let loose into the atmosphere. Now this I think makes us feel like perhaps our work is a little bit futile. For any given tree, the cycle, the circle is closed tree grows, it pulls in CO2, it dies, it decomposes and releases its CO2 back into the air. And that just keeps happening. A new tree grows in its place, pulls in CO2, dies, decomposes and gives it off. But I think I thought that this was maybe a helpful metaphor and a way to think of it. If we think of this picture as a metaphor of the earth, there are forested areas and non-forested areas. And so let's just imagine for the moment that we managed to stop burning fossil fuels entirely. Then we're gonna be sitting still at that high level of CO2 in the atmosphere of about <clears throat> 420 parts per million. And we wanna get that down to a more manageable level. So inside this forested area over here, we have trees growing and dying and decomposing and new ones growing in their place. And that cycle is sort of happening and it, it ends up being relatively neutral. But now let's imagine that we move out and we plant another whole bunch of trees out here 
Now those trees are going to pull another bunch of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And let's say they bring us, I'm making these numbers up, completely making them up, 400, they bring us down to 415 parts per million. And now we're going to start that neutral cycle, but now we're at a lower level. And now we plant a whole bunch more trees. We get down to say 410 parts per million. And now we cycle again at that lower level. So that is to be our vision is to um, keep adding on top of what we have now so that we're achieving greater levels of reduction. So our first strategy for half of us here in this, in this conference these two days is to plant more trees. Our other strategy will be for the other half of us to lock up the corals of the world. So instead of letting those mushrooms get to work, if we take the wood in that tree and turn it into things that are valuable and timeless, like this house in the top picture is, um, dates back to the 15th century, then we have locked Carl into that sugar molecule. He can't transform into CO2 and he can't be released into the atmosphere to wreak more havoc. And the bottom three pictures on the right are products I took the liberty of stealing off of the website of my co-presenters and our sponsors to show the work that we all are doing, that you all are doing, um, to help lock up the corals of the world into the future, let's say 2200, and on moving forward from that. So in closing, um, hopefully this end part has all worked out, but I'd like to close by dedicating this presentation to my little guy, Felix Stellan Rapton, First, because he was oddly fascinated by this presentation and listened to me give it at least five times and helped me with all those crazy CO2 molecules. And also because we gave him his middle name, Stellan, to remind him and us that we all, like Carl, are made of the dust of stars. Um, Colleen, thank you. We'll gather the questions for you and we'll follow up with you. Um, that was a fabulous presentation, um, and yay, Felix. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy, and uh, it, was, it was fun to put together. Yeah.